Hello and thanks for tuning in to hear our conversation today with Derek Ray, international soccer commentator. Excited to have Derek with us today. My name is Eric McIlia and I'm the general manager of World Strike Sports Division. Our starting series is based around starting a living series is based around conversations with some of the top minds in the world of football with a specific interest around leadership culture and their football journey. I'm excited today to welcome Derek to see, share some of his experiences, insights and reflections with our global community. Growing up in Aberdeen, Scotland, Derek used to take his tape recorder to matches to work on his commentary and following a move to the US to work in the 1994 World Cup, Derek now lives in Massachusetts, commentating on matches all around the world, including the German Bundesliga, English Premier League, and also as the voice of the commentary on the video game FIFA 20. Derek, welcome and thanks for joining us. And how are you doing today? Well, Eric, thank you for having me. It's a great privilege to be in this starting 11 with so many great names. I'm well. I'm, I'm home here in Massachusetts, as you mentioned, which is a bit of a sea change for me because I tend to spend a lot of my life normally traveling. Actually, I should probably whisper it. I've quite enjoyed uh, being within my four walls for a change. So, yeah, that is a big change. And that's a beautiful part of the world where you are up in New England, Derek. And I'm sure you love being in that area. Yeah, I've actually spent, it's, it's funny you mentioned this because I was thinking about it the other day, I've actually spent, even though I'm proudly Scottish and grew up in Scotland, I've spent half my adult life, probably more than that, um, here in New England, in Massachusetts, on the coast. We're just about 20 miles north of Boston. We can walk to the ocean in five minutes from the house. Uh, it really is heaven at, at certain times of year. In winter, it can be a bit bleak, but I'm sure that may take you back a little bit to the North Sea in your early days of Aberdeen, Derek, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, there are times when it does, when it's grey and the wind is coming from the wrong direction. Uh, it, it does bring back great memories of, of Aberdeen on the North Sea coast. Oh, I'm sure. Well, just to get us rolling here, Derek, you and I first connected a little bit last year at the Women's World Cup. I personally spent over three weeks in France for... You know, a phenomenal experience. Loved every piece of it. There was a little piece of me loved the, the Scotland journey. There was a little piece of me loved the USA journey. But just the whole spectacle for me was fantastic to be attached to. And, you know, I, I think I was your unofficial ticket scalper on the, <laughs> the, the highly touted USA versus France game. And, you know, but, but you know, just using that for our kickoff point here, I, I know that was a, a phenomenal experience for you and, and you've done many of them. But, you know, how did that whole experience go for you, Derek? Well, it's great to hear you talking so enthusiastically about the Women's World Cup because uh, I thought it was one of the, the best, most enjoyable tournament experiences I've ever had. And I've done a lot of men's World Cups. I've done every one since 1990. This was my third Women's World Cup. And on all levels, it was tremendous. It had a terrific vibe. Um, Going into it, we felt there were many different countries who could win it. Yeah. As it turned out, the USA were by far and away the best team. But for certain games, and you mentioned the ticket aspect, that France-USA game was always going to be, if you like, the final before the final. If everything went to plan, all roads led to that game in Paris. And I should say thank you for that ticket on behalf of my co-commentator, Danielle Slayton, because Danielle's husband, John, because of his yeah. job, he works in the legal business, was able to sort of duck in and out of the games, do a bit of traveling while we were on our travels. And he would sort of pop up at, at, at random moments. And um, he popped up before the, the France-USA game, but we didn't have a ticket for him for that game. Oh, yeah. so, so you very kindly stepped in. And, oh, you're and, welcome. And, so, and, you know, again, as I say, when you think of the, you know, the stature and, and the event that, that France put on, and I, I, I probably have attended about a dozen games. I attended China versus Russia. I attended all the USA games. I was down in Nice for the Scotland versus England game. And, and to your point, I, I just thought it was a fantastic spectacle. You know, when you look at the, you know, the, the equitable lay of, lay of the land with regards to the teams, but just across the board. And, you know, I'm sure for you to be so closely connected to it, I saw a lot of the games that you were commentating on. That must have been just a buzz for you to, you know, to see women's soccer at that level. It was, and it really started for me way back, I would say, probably January before June. And one of the great things about being a freelance is you can make your own schedule. So I decided that the Women's World Cup was going to be my most important event of the year by some distance. And that allowed me to 
spend a lot of time, you know, way more time than I normally would be able to devote to individual teams, to doing my homework, to watching them all, to talking to people. And that was the other great thing about covering that Women's World Cup. The access was much better than you would get uh, in comparison with a men's event. So I went into that World Cup feeling as though, you know, I really had everything at my fingertips. And um, during the tournament too, the access was terrific. And, you know, that as a commentator, is worth its weight in gold because you're able to tell stories that you really can't always tell when you don't have that access. So, um, you know, to cover, and you mentioned it, so many different countries, so many different cultures, um, so many, you know, unexpected happenings. You know, Argentina, we went into it thinking they were quite possibly going to be the worst team in the competition. <laughs> we got that wrong, for sure. Um, and that's just one example. Um, you know, I got to cover the Netherlands virtually every game, and that was I thought a really upbeat story from start to finish. They were outplayed by the USA in the final. Um, France disappointed me a bit, I have to say, the, the, yeah. the national team of France, not the country at all, but yeah. the national team, because I, I do to this day believe that they were better than they showed in that game against the USA. And I think the US, don't get me wrong, demonstrated an awful lot just about how good they are. But I think from the attitude point of view, I think France were almost beaten before they started and, and the US went into it with the right attitude and, and the French crumbled on that big stage, which they've done before at women's level in big tournaments. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I know you, you like myself, Derek, you're still a very proud Scot. What was, what was your opinion you know, of the aftermath of, of the Scottish journey, you know, and the VAR and the Argentina game and, you know, and I was at all the games and, and it was so near yet so far, but, you know, I'm sure you were, your excitement levels and your blood pressure was raising like mine. You only need to talk to colleagues. I was broadcasting for Fox Sports in France and we had this beautiful location. We were in the Champagne countryside getting ready for our game, uh, a few hours later and we you know pitched our tents there and um, we're all in front of the tv and my goodness they will tell you that I, I i was a mess after that game i was a mess and actually even the next day and the day after that i was i was still a bit of a mess uh, i i could not come to terms with what had happened i was watching scotland and thinking finally here we have a team yeah that is going to do it. Here we have a team that's playing with confidence. And, and Eric, you, you know all about our, our men's national team and, yeah. and what has happened to us down the years in, in major competitions when we get into situations where something good might happen. It didn't enter my head that anything bad was going to happen in those last few minutes. But um, then, I don't know. I don't know what happened. There, there, there was some sort of yeah. um, change of mentality yeah. and dropping back further and further and defensive negative mentality set in and then I think you've also got to say in fairness everything that could happen in a bad way happened um, and um, oh, it, it's still painful to, to relive those memories what I do hope is I, I do try to think positively I hope that we can learn from that and come the next major tournament um, you know, have that in the memory bank as, as something that you don't want to do. Because I think the ability was there with that squad. I, I, I think actually Scotland, and, and I stand by this, I think Scotland were amongst the, I'm going to say the top half of countries in that Women's World Cup on ability. You know, maybe even top 10. You know, maybe even top 10 should have been where we, we rated them. But um, it wasn't to be against Argentina. So sad. I so agree. And, you know, you look at some of the... the, the the talent that Scotland had, you look at Aaron Cuthbert and Kim Little and Rachel Corsett, they, they just had a fantastic backbone and I, I thought this was our chance. But certainly to bounce back a little bit here, Derek, and, you know, as we touched on, you're a very, very proud Scot and growing up in Aberdeen, you know, excited to hear your journey of, you know, how you've, you've worked your way to beautiful Massachusetts from the early days at Hazelhead Academy in Aberdeen. Um, give us a little insight to, to how it all started for you in Aberdeen, Derek. Well, I can remember the first game I went to at Petaudry. Obviously, I, I played football, not to any great level, but I played with everybody else in the playground, in the park, and then at school. But I, I remember my dad taking me down to play putting um, right by the beach in Aberdeen in the early 1970s. Um, we had 
you know, these putting greens and right beside the, uh, the, the, the Lynx golf course, in actual fact. And Pataudry was, you know, two minute walk from there. So as we were putting, Aberdeen were playing and you could hear the, the roar of the crowd. You could hear the singing and everything. And um, this confirms that I'm from an Aberdonian family, I suppose, because um, around the 60, 65 minute mark in those days, they used to just open the gates and people could leave or come in as they saw fit. So my father said to me, um, okay, we've done our putting for the day. Fancy going in to see the end of the football match? And I said, yeah, yeah, why not? So we went in and I just remember everything, you know, being in Technicolor. I'm thinking, wow, this is incredible. You know, here we are, you know, I'd seen it on TV before, but remember we only had black and white TVs back then. So it was all there in color and all these names, you know, that I'd, I'd started to hear about uh, and saw the end of the game. And I said to my dad, could we go back and see a full game? Um, so, so we did. And, and the next one was Aberdeen against Clyde. And from that point on, I, I was absolutely hooked on the Dons. And, and they and were that, my that team. That must have been the era of probably Joe Harper and Drew Jarvie. And, you know, the, you think back to the, the players. Maybe Arthur Graham? Was Arthur Graham? Yes, there? Bumper Graham was, was, was part of that team. And Bobby what Clark. Player he was. He, he, Arthur Graham was a terrific winger and probably should have done more in his career than he actually did. He did a fair amount also yeah. south of the border. Um, yeah. uh, but also Bobby Clark, who, of course, has oh, yeah. been one of your guests on, on this series. And, you know, Bobby was just a, a wonderful goalkeeper and, and also a pillar of the Aberdeen community. He did everything in Aberdeen. He was a teacher. He was yeah. a basketball player, very good basketball player, too. And just loved by absolutely everyone, not from Aberdeen originally, but uh, I think he would probably tell you himself, he, he feels a bit like an Aberdonian nowadays from the time he spent there. Um, but yeah, Harper, um, you mentioned Arthur Graham. Drew Jarvie was the outfield player who I, for some reason, most connected with. There was just something very silky yeah. about Drew. He wasn't the fastest player, but he had natural skill. He could do things with the ball that you wanted to emulate. He was old-fashioned in terms of, you know, how could I describe him? He, he was not your um, prototypical fashion-conscious footballer or anything yeah. like that. He was just your everyman. He was just the yeah. sort of guy you would see in the street, and he happened to play football. Yeah. And that was typical of that entire generation. They were all local heroes to me, all yeah. those players. You know, Willie Miller had come through um, yeah. as, as the, the great young hope. Davey Robb was another one who, uh, you know, could do amazing things, didn't do them every single game, was, was yeah. maddeningly inconsistent, but did have a flair for the dramatic. So, so players of that era... Uh, we'd had Zoltan Varga, who, who, who played for Aberdeen for a very brief spell, but goes down in history as one of the, the all-time Aberdeen greats. It, he was a bit controversial when he arrived for a variety of reasons after what had happened previously in Germany with Hertha. So, yeah, that was my era uh, of discovering the Dons, the early 1970s. But you look at that kind of club, and even today, Aberdeen as a club, it's a very, very um, community-based and community-driven club. There, you know, Aberdonians are very proud Aberdeen fans. You know, I, I always remember it was the kind of the first all-seated stadium back in the day. I remember the, the gravel parking lot that used to be the training ground right outside yeah. the main stand. And, you know, and, and every Aberdonian was super proud to be an Aberdeen fan. And, and they had the chip on their shoulder because just when you became a fan in the 70s and the early 80s, it was the new firm. It was Aberdeen and Dundee United and they were going down to and they were going to the west of Scotland and they were taking on the big guns. And I'm sure that... That journey must have been super exciting for you back then. It was. Um, I think we probably got a bit complacent, actually. And I'm talking about somebody who was in his teens when Aberdeen were scaling the heights. And you could make a strong case, really, for Aberdeen as the best team in Europe back in 1983. You know, if you beat Real Madrid in the Cup Winners' Cup final, having beaten Bayern in the quarters and then go on to beat Hamburg in the Super Cup, I think you're entitled to say that if you're not the best team in Europe, you're certainly right up there. Um, so, you know, from the 70s when Aberdeen were sort of, you know, pretenders, um, you know, in with a chance of winning things, did win the League Cup in 1976, which was memorable. But then, of course, Fergie took them on. Uh, after Ali McLeod and Billy McNeil had played their part. And Fergie really made them winners. You know, Fergie changed the whole attitude. A lot of it was chip on the shoulder stuff. Um, you know, the number of times he quoted the West Coast media. We used to all hate the West Coast media. We didn't really know what he was talking about, the West Coast media, but it was a nice thing to sort of discuss amongst friends. Oh, yeah, and the, the people on the West Coast, they all hate us. 
well, you know, they probably didn't. But it, again, it was a way of, of getting players motivated and, and getting fans motivated too. Because um, it was very much against the head, so to speak, what the Dons did with Dundee United. And I always like to say that, that the team from down the road, from Tannadice, led by Jim McLean and very ably by Jim McLean, um, had the effect of, of making Aberdeen better. And I think the opposite applied too. I think they spurred each other on. And both Ferguson and McLean would talk about this, about how they, they needed each other, really, because it was a sort of a counterweight to the traditional um, footballing strength from the west of Scotland, from Celtic and Rangers. And do you remember the, the, the Sir Alex Ferguson influence on your city? You know, as a teenage kid kind of coming through. Very much. And all of a sudden... You know, and I've read all his books, and I remember what he did in Paisley with St. Mirren. You know, he kind of grabbed Paisley by the neck, and he was around the, the dark nights, and he was around the pubs, and he was the chief marketing officer, and he was, you know, did they have that same influence on your city? 100%. Absolutely. That's the one thing I remember about Alex Ferguson in those days. The number of people, and, you know, it's a small place, Aberdeen. Okay, it's a city. It's 200 plus, 200,000 plus, but... Everybody knows everybody else in Aberdeen, you know, still to this day, probably back then even more so. And the number of times I would hear conversations that involved being at people being at some function or another, and Alex Ferguson was there. Yeah. You know, he seemed to manage to pop up at almost any dinner, any, you know, dance, anything that was happening, he was there. And I think he saw it as his role very early on to be the ringmaster, if you like. The, yeah. the, you know, he was the football manager, yes, but he saw that part of the job was almost uh, you know, being an evangelist, if you like, for yeah. the club that now he, he was in charge of. And, and he did it so well. And, and he got everybody pulling in the same direction. And you know, at that stage, it was very hard to envisage anybody from Aberdeen not supporting the Dons. There were one or two you know, who, who obviously had... Um, preference for Celtic or Rangers or other clubs, maybe based on their father, you know, who he supported. But the bulk of people, as, as I remember, were all in with Aberdeen. And, and why would you not have been? So, so how, did this, how did this journey begin for you, Derek, as, as you put the microphone up in front of your mouth? And certainly I've read a lot in your journey and your story and my research. And it's fascinating because you're a languages guy, because, you, you know, I, I think of where you've lived and you know, thinking back to the very, very early days, and, and it's funny, I've watched some of your social media input over the last couple of days about, you know, you volunteering in hospital radio and things like that. And, you know, where did that, where was your initial, your initial opportunities? Well, I should probably tell you the story about how the broadcasting started. Uh, it started for me at a very young age. So I'm talking here about 1974. Uh, I was seven years of age, and we had just bought our very first stereo cassette recorder. Um, younger people will think, what on earth is a stereo cassette <laughs> recorder? Yeah. But it was a magical tool, a magical thing to have in the house. Now, just as we bought this, the World Cup was on in 1974 in West Germany. First World Cup I can remember. And I was transfixed. I was glued to every game, morning, noon and night, it seemed. They would replay the games from the night before in the morning. I'd watch them again, even though I had previously watched them the night before. And I just became obsessed with this World Cup. But in addition to being obsessed with the football, I also realized that I was obsessed with the broadcasting of the football. Yeah. And so I immediately um, used the cassette recorder to do my own commentaries or my own impersonations of the commentators at the time and the various pundits. I still have those tapes somewhere. It's yeah. quite, quite funny to occasionally go back and listen to them. So that was where it was born. And then from there, I progressed to having my own portable tape recorder, and I would just take it around with me. And if people were playing football in the playground, I would record my commentary on it. Um, from there, and I, you know, don't laugh, I graduated <laughs> to Pataudry, to doing the same thing at Pataudry. And I would do it at reserve games. I would just do my own commentary, and I would listen back later and try to sort of, you know, be critical and think, okay, I, you know, could I be better here, there, or somewhere else? Um, then to first team games, and I know that for a section of the uh, Aberdeen support in the South Stand, I became known as that daft laddie who sits and talks to himself for 90 minutes, you know, but I didn't really care, you know, because I thought to myself, I really love doing this. And who knows, maybe someday there'd be a chance to, to do this professionally. I didn't realistically think that was going to happen, but I thought, well, if you don't try and you don't try to better yourself, then it's never going to happen. So what I did was I sent one of those tapes to 
the, the person who was my hero in broadcasting in Scotland, and, and I'm sure you'll remember um, the late, great David Francie. Oh, yes, I do. D David Francie, I should explain for anybody who doesn't know, um, was the voice of Scottish football for, for many of us. Now, particularly for people uh, in the northeast of Scotland, because we didn't have commercial radio to the extent that you did in the West. So that our football on the radio was from BBC Radio Scotland. And that meant David Francie, you know, you know, very distinctive way of talking, you know, very, yes. you know, yes. very much his own style. But I, I loved listening to him. And, and I would just sit, you know, with my ear to the radio if I wasn't at a game or if it was a midweek game and, and, you know, just imbibe. So I wrote a letter to David Francie with my tape, not thinking I would hear back from him. Three weeks later, I did hear back from the great man. Got this beautiful letter with, um, you know, some tips, uh, you know, critique. Uh, and just saying, you know, really like what you're doing here, um, stay in touch. So we sort of did, you know, for the next few years, you know, not necessarily every month or even every six months, but just once in a while, I would send him another tape. And then um, during that time, I went to work for Hospital Radio in Aberdeen. So that was in my teens. And Hospital Radio, for anybody who doesn't know, is all voluntary. Um, it's designed so that people in hospitals who are having a hard time can have a personalized radio service. And again, in Scotland in the 80s, we didn't have a lot of radio. You know, there weren't many radio choices, nothing like what you have nowadays. So to have a personalized radio service, requests and dedications, and some live football. So we would do the Aberdeen Reserve games and the Aberdeen home games. And, and I would do that for them. You know, when I was 16, 17, continued doing that into my university time, studied German and politics, first year at university. I would go every Saturday to do that. Also in midweek, some bits and bobs for them, kept the tapes going and sent another one to David. I was 19 at this point, uh, 1986. And this tells you everything about the generosity of David Francie. And I've always tried to um, emulate that yeah. in terms of how I behave with young yeah. aspiring broadcasters and, and, and looking to give them opportunities. Instead of just writing back with advice, he passed the tape on to his bosses at Radio Scotland. And out of the blue, I got a letter from Charles Runcie, who was the producer of sport for BBC Radio Scotland, saying, David has given me this tape. Um, I've had a listen. I like what I hear. Could you come down to Glasgow for a chat sometime? You know, maybe when you have a, a little break from university. And um, so I did. We had the chat. And a few weeks later, because David had picked up a knee injury, he wasn't able to do the game that he would normally do on a Saturday. I got the call. Uh, and it was a fairly urgent call on a Friday afternoon. Could you jump on the train and come down to Glasgow? So I did that. The, the game the next day was Kilmarnock against Dumbarton, April 1986. And that was my debut. It was a second tier game. But in those days, Radio Scotland would often cover a second tier game for their live commentary match. And Kilmarnock won handily, 3-0. I got plenty of good action. I got a red card in the game as well. Ian Bryson scored a magnificent goal, as I recall. Uh, so I did the game and I thought, okay, um, I've done it now. Who knows what happens? Maybe I'll get a call again, you know, in six months, maybe never again, but at least I can say I've done it. So I got back to Aberdeen that night and there was a message. Could you call Charles Runcie? So I called Charles Runcie and he said, well done today. Um, I would like to make you a second offer. There's another game coming up in a few days time, which you'll know all about, but we would like you to broadcast it England against Scotland at Wembley. No. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> that was my second game on the air, was England against Scotland at Wembley. I'd never been to Wembley. I'd never even been to an England-Scotland game or a Scotland-England game because Aberdeen to Glasgow in those days wasn't yeah. necessarily a journey that a young person would make. And so this was my first England-Scotland experience on air at Wembley Stadium just a few days later with uh, Mike Ingham as my co-commentator, fellow commentator, and John Gregg, who had been my partner for the first game at Rugby Park, Kilmarnock against Dumbarton as the co-commentator. And from there, I, I was lucky enough to, to remain attached to BBC for five years. And, um, you know, what I will say, Eric, is in any business, you know, in, in any sphere of life, you have to be lucky. You do have to be very fortunate. Yeah. But the, the thing is that once luck comes your way, you have to be in a position to walk through that door. I think it applies to footballers, it applies to football managers, it applies to commentators. Without that big initial break, it might never happen for us. So you've got to push for the break, but you've also got to be ready to make it work for yourself when that break arrives. Of course, and I think of 
you know, a, a young lad from Aberdeen getting that call about a Scotland England game to go to Wembley, I'm sure there must have been a, a whole range of emotions for you at that time. You know, is is you've just done one game, you've just got you've just dipped your toe in the water, you know, and here you are, you know, three, four days later getting the ultimate game. Yeah, it's funny when I when I think back to that whole week, I, I should have been, you know, shaking like a leaf, but I wasn't. I wasn't that nervous. Um, I don't know if that it was youth, uh, you know, talking, you know, youthful behavior. Um, I think part of it was that I had collected so much experience through hospital radio, through making my own tapes, that I had confidence in, in my own ability. So yeah. the, the one thing I wasn't going to do was dry up or, or just, oh, sorry, I can't do this, because I'd been sort of training myself for that moment for a long time in my mind and thinking it might never arrive. And I often think back and compare and contrast with a young footballer. And if he or she has been preparing for years and years, you know, training, working on technique, you know, a lot of it done perhaps in their own time, that when, when the big moment comes along, when they get their first team debut, you know, whether it's with a big club or, or, or you know, a smaller club, it doesn't really make any difference. They feel on their mind that they're ready. And we see that time and again with young players. We think, my goodness, you know, they, they just look as though this is what they've been doing every day of their life. Well, perhaps, maybe not every day of their life, but perhaps they have been in their minds. And, uh, and the mind can be a, an interesting thing. And, and what a fascinating journey since then, Derek, you know, as you look at, uh, I watch closely, your, you know, your, 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 your journey right now and where you are. And, and you became an expert in the German world. Obviously, you were a languages student. And, you know, you, the, that's certainly an area that you've got such, you know, a, a large amount of expertise, German football. German football really uh, comes from the heart, Eric. Uh, it, it goes back to my young days as well. I always say that the, the two countries really that, um, that, that are, are me are, yeah. are Scotland and Germany. Yeah. Um, and, and Scotland is, is where it was born. The, the love of football, the early years, Aberdeen, um, working for BBC Radio Scotland. But there was this sort of parallel track that was happening at the same time, uh, studying German, uh, which was my favorite subject at school. Um, I happened to be good at it. I happened to absolutely adore it. And again, I was helped by the fact that in Aberdeen, um, because of the North Sea, we had a direct radio link with uh, one of the German stations in Hamburg. We could hear it almost all hours of the day um, because of you know, the freakish signal that would just travel up the North Sea. So I found this very useful as a young person who wanted to, to improve my German on a daily basis, being able to listen to German radio. Again, before internet, before there were other ways of doing it, to have this German radio station, and they covered the Bundesliga. So I was able to listen to the Bundesliga. So I got two passions for the price of one. I got my, my German fix, but I got to listen to football. And so I quickly became sort of in my mind, a, a, a German football guy. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to have some connection with German football. And, and that didn't really arrive until much later in my life on a professional level. But when I went to Germany for the first time uh, and, and went to, to help in a, a very small school on the border, actually, of what was uh, West Germany with East Germany. When I say on the border, I mean, you know, where that bookshelf is behind me, that was the border. I mean, right, right there. And you could see the, the guards on the other side um, of the, the fence. Um, so, so that really enhanced my sort of German cultural love and love of football. And I would go to all manner of games, not just the Bundesliga, I'd go to second division games. I'd go to, to uh, amateur games in the area. I just found there was something about German football that really spoke to me in tandem with the, uh, right. the language side of it. And in, in recent years, you know, even though I've always had this connection and I've, I've been to Germany many times, in recent years, it's been cemented by working for the Bundesliga's world feed as one of their commentators. So um, I, I do spend quite a bit of time in Germany broadcasting games which then get picked up around the world and, and that truly is a labor of love yeah and let's let's fast forward to 1994 the, the world cup in the usa derek and you know obviously it was it was at that time you know the usa didn't have a you know a bona fide league as such and it was you know it was still trying to you know get itself at you know the old nasl had fallen through and you know there, there was certainly a, a big expectation on the shoulders of the usa to host a world cup in the right manner. But you look back in hindsight and it was certainly an exceptional spectacle. 
but there was Derek Gray, and and you know, can you can you talk us through that journey a little bit? What a journey that was. Uh, I, I will cherish that period of my life forever. So many things happened to me, um, but mostly because of that World Cup. And what had happened was in 1991, I had decided uh, that after five years at the BBC, and this again was youth talking, I had done everything I wanted to do for the time being. I mean, crazy really, because there was still so much more to do, but I was a bit impatient, you know, and I thought I want to try something else. And I had discovered America, I'd been there been here a couple of times um and uh, so i went here i went to to boston originally to um to do some freelance work didn't really have any prospects but i had previously met some of the people who were to be in charge of the world cup organizing committee and again it's a small world here but there's a guy called jerry trekker who um you know very respected football writer who I'd interviewed a few times when I'd been on BBC Radio Scotland. I was always looking for somebody in the USA who could talk knowledgeably about the sport. And it's funny, when I'd been in Boston as a tourist, I'd found um, in an old books, bookshop this book by Jerry Trekker about the history of US soccer. And um, so I sort of scribbled down his details and he was the guy I called and became sort of my regular correspondent, if you like, in the U.S. Well, it turns out that Jerry's brother, Jim, well-known name in U.S. soccer circles uh, and also in NASL circles back in the day, was the head of media for the World Cup Organizing Committee. Right. So um, Jerry was able to, to go to his brother and say, by the way, I think this guy, Ray, might be a really good shout for you. And he's in Boston. You know, you're looking for somebody who has a bit of background in the sport. He's got languages. Um, you know, he's not somebody you're going to have to introduce to the, to the whole um, subject, uh, subject of, of what the sport is. And, and Jim Trekker and I hit it off, um, I, I would say from my point of view, better than almost anybody that I've uh, worked with. Yeah. before or since and um what a great boss he was inspirational figure to me i'll always be very grateful and um so i was his man in boston and when you're a media officer for a world cup organizing committee what you do is you you do a lot of work that might seem unglamorous because much of it is uh, facilities you know media centers um chairs tables uh, telephone lines all that but i actually found that really enjoyable um, in addition to that, working with media, trying to explain to them, sometimes a skeptical media in the USA, what the World Cup was, obviously the operations on match day. And, and that was the fascinating part from, um, from the football fans point of view, because I had access, I couldn't write about it or talk about it, but I had access to like it, which you never have as a journalist, you know, so all these managers would come in looking at training sites, Dick Advocate, I remember coming in, Alfio Basile, they Argent, Argentina coach coming in and I would drive them around because because yeah. because I would I would volunteer our, our bosses would say okay who wants to drive we've got um, Dick Advocat from the Netherlands coming in does anybody want to drive into the training sites I'll do that yeah. <laughs> and so what it allowed me to do was build up relationships with certain people that I would never have had the chance to to meet otherwise and that no journalists would get the chance to meet and obviously I'm wearing a different hat at that point yeah. I'm wearing my my world cup blazer yeah. and I'm you know I'm, I'm there to to be an organizer not to be somebody who's who's writing or talking about it but in retrospect it, it was just a terrific experience the world cup was a huge success as we know in terms of um, what it did wow. yeah what it did for the sport in the USA I firmly believe that we wouldn't have had major league soccer if it hadn't been for the world cup we wouldn't have had the the interest to come in years ahead and just on a world level the attendance figures through the roof and um yeah so blessed to have been part of that and i totally agree Derek. i think you know without the because there was certainly a lot of eggs in that basket for 94 usa to be a success but the kickoff of mls in 96 was a direct result of the success of world cup 94 now you can uh, you know here's this little laddie from from hazelhead academy you know, and, and beautiful New England trying to find his way and driving Dick Advocate around the, you know, I-95. And, <laughs> and I'm sure that was, you know, at, at that, especially being such a, you know, dyed-in-the-wool soccer fan, uh, you were just living your dream at that time. I absolutely was. And, and I didn't think you could live that kind of dream in the USA. Nobody thought that because the sport had not established itself on that level at all. And um, 
I used to live in those days, Eric, I used to live in Boston itself, just about five minutes walk from our office. Our office was right in government center. Yeah. And uh, I chose a, a tiny little cramped apartment in the north end of yeah. Boston. And the north end of Boston is the traditional Italian section. Yeah. And I, I tell you, I, I just have so many great memories of that time in my life because I was living and breathing the sport on a professional level day in, day out. I got away from broadcasting, which was my first love, yeah. but I realized how much I enjoyed being in the inner sanctum, if you like, for this period. But the other great thing was um, when I had a day off, say on a Sunday, um, I would go back to my little apartment in the North End. And of course, uh, in those days, you had a lot of older Italians who lived in that area. And what did they do? They would congregate in the local coffee shops and watch Serie A. Yeah. So I had this little spell of about, you know, two, three years where the club football I watched was Serie A. And that was around the time when you could legitimately say it was the best football in the world. So yeah. those early, um, for example, premiership, as it was called uh, in the day years in England, they're a bit of a blank to me because I didn't watch much English football. All the football I watched in those days, apart from the international games, uh, came from Serie A. Yeah, but, the, but let's go back to, you know, I, again, I love hearing these stories. And I'm sure, you know, you were living, living your dream at that time. Um, you know, I, I think my question is, you know, going through your journey, have you ever been or, or is it something, do you get starstruck at any time? You know, is, is it the, the Sir Alex Ferguson or the Dick Advocat or, you know, it, because I look at all these stadiums and, and, and the job and the role that you do is you must some, run into some heavy hitters and, and some people that have had, you know, an amazing journey. And, and, and I'm sure you just take that in your stride. But I'm sure, you know, there must be one or two that, that overwhelm you a little bit that you're starstruck as well in their company. You're going to laugh at this at some of the names that I throw up on, on this one. Eric. Um, it's funny, modern professionals, and, and I've been lucky enough to be in the company of a few of them, don't leave me starstruck. But the ones who do are the ones who were prominent when I was a boy. And you get to meet them as an adult. And it's, um, yeah, I mean, Franz Beckenbauer is the one who really you know, jumps out at me when I think of that, because obviously Beckenbauer in 74, he was the face of that World Cup, along with Cruyff. I mean, the two of them, maybe Gert Müller as well, you would throw in. But uh, Beckenbauer just oozed class. He was the Kaiser. He was sort of who everybody wanted to be. I mean, he was, you know, who was cooler than Franz Beckenbauer? Well, I mean, I, I've, I've met him on a few occasions. I had one occasion when um, he sat down with me we were in a hotel, actually, in Munich. This would have been about 12, 13 years ago, an interview he had agreed to do. And it was just the two of us and his agent for an hour. Um, and we were bouncing between English and German. And it turned out that we actually had a few mutual friends from his time at the Cosmos. And I had to sort of pinch myself on that one because I was thinking, here I am sitting for an hour with Franz Beckenbauer. This is absolutely crazy. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, and I think you'll understand where I'm coming from here. The other people who actually leave me starstruck are people who maybe weren't big names on a world level back in the 1970s when I was growing up, but who were football names in Scotland. Yeah. And I think, for example, of Andy Ritchie. Remember Andy oh. Ritchie of Morton? Oh, I do. And what a player. I mean, he, yeah. won the Scottish, he won the Scottish Player of the Year back when Morton were a nobody. You know, and... I distinctly remember, I was a Claybank season ticket holder, Derek, and I remember watching Andy Ritchie in my early teens. He came to Claybank, and Claybank at that time had Davy Cooper, and yep. Morton had Andy Ritchie. And, and I distinctly remember, you know, Andy Ritchie was in the same sentence as Davy Cooper. No, you know, I, what a quality player. An amazing player, and Aberdeen fans know all about him because he seemed to reserve his best performances with Morton for matches against the Dons. Just ask Fergie about that. He'll tell yeah. you, yeah. God, you know, Andy Ritchie again. What is it about Ritchie? What is it about Morton? I mean, he, he was, he, he seemed to do it almost every game. But um, I mean, he came up and introduced himself to me at one point um, a few years ago when I was working in Scotland. And I thought, my, my God, and, and I, I couldn't get enough of the conversation. I wanted it to last for an e forever and ever because there was just a natural footballer. Another example of that would be, you know, more high profile player and, and I actually genuinely think a world class player. Um, when Neil Lennon was in charge of Celtic, he brought Danny McGrain on oh. board as part of the coaching staff. And I was working with Gary McAllister at this point, who obviously, you know, <laughs> pretty 
high level yeah. player himself. But um, I could see that Gary, who's just slightly older than me, but you know, we're the same, same vintage really. I could see that Gary held Danny McGrain in the same esteem that I did and do. Yeah. And um, I used to, you know, and Danny is, is salt of the earth kind of guy, that, yeah. that there is nothing arrogant or cocky about Danny McGrain. He's just a, a bloke, you know what I mean? But yeah. um, whenever I would talk to Danny McGrain, I would say to people, I can't believe I'm talking to Danny McGrain. You know, I, I know that that sounds absolutely crazy nowadays, but you know, to me, Danny McGrain was the best fullback in the world. He was just a classy footballer. I didn't support Celtic. They weren't my team. It yeah. did not matter one iota. Yeah. Danny McGrain for me was, you know, peerless really. And um, so, so it's at times like that. And, and, and even, you know, Going up and down the, the scale of footballers, even so, you know, part-time players, yeah. uh, I, I got such a kick out of meeting them because yeah. I remembered their football back in the 70s yeah. and the 80s. And that is one of the reasons, Eric, why I love this sport so much oh, because yeah. there is always a connection somewhere oh. and it is a common language. And, and you know, as you say, it's such a common language. You know, and, and, and just to jump back to Danny McGrain, I, I asked David Moyes the question, yesterday when we were having our conversation, his early influences at Celtic as a youth player. And his first response was Danny McGrain. You know, yeah. and it's so ironic that you raised the name Danny McGrain. He was, you know, probably underrated, probably the original, you know, attacking fullback before his prime. Yeah. And and was just an exceptional player in that day. But, you know, it was, it was interesting, David said, that was the first player that David mentioned as an early influence on his career. Wow. And, and said exactly the same description of Danny McGrain as you did. And it's just amazing that, you know, those kind of people, the influence that you have in your life going forward. But what I also said prior when I was talking to Peter Martin earlier today is I look back and I felt blessed to grow up in Scotland in that era, you know, because for a small population of five and a half million people, we had some exceptional players come out of their country. You know, when you think back to the Alan Hansen, the Graham Sooness, the Kenny Dalglish, you know, and you could keep going. And, and I actually had a soft spot for Liverpool back in those days because of the Scottish backbone they had. You know, it was Stevie Nicholl, it was Gary Gillespie, it was Alan Hansen, it was Sunez. You know, prior to that was Shankly. But again, you know, I'm sure you're the same when, when you begin to think back to those days growing up in that era. Undoubtedly. And, uh, you know, I, I, wasn't, I wouldn't say I was a supporter of Leeds United, but I used to enjoy watching Leeds United in the 70s for the exact same reason. You know, if you think about that Leeds United team, you had, you know, from David Harvey to Billy Bremner to Joe Jordan to Peter Lorimer to Eddie Arthur Graham. Graham. Arthur yeah, Graham. Arthur Graham, of course, Bumper, who went there as well. I mean, that felt like a Scottish team. Yeah. And, you know, Liverpool, similarly, Liverpool always had that Scottish backbone. Manchester United did as well. I mean, they all did back yeah. then. So I think it's a shame, really, when I think back to that era, um, I regret that we didn't, as a nation, do better we didn't really do ourselves justice I mean we came close in 74 yeah. in a very difficult group and um, when all was said and done that first game against Zaire when we didn't yeah. really realize not realizing that you'd have to score a lot of goals against Zaire and we sort of conserved for the for the next two games you know we came close in 74 78 again we blew it yeah. 82 again it was a difficult group but we blew it in that last game when things were looking up um, and then, and so on and so on. So, so I think that's the one thing that's hard. It's quite hard, Eric, and this is probably a good conversation for the two of us to have as, as Scots who live in the USA. It's quite hard, I think, to convey to younger people um, what a football mad country we come from and the extent to which we actually did have some really top level professionals at a certain time. We don't yeah. so much now, maybe one or two coming through, but yeah. back then we did, yet we didn't do ourselves justice. And, and I think, you know, I say to everybody, and I said this again in a previous recording, is I felt blessed to grow up in just randomly in Glasgow. And, you know, probably similar to yourself, I was a very, very passionate football fan, just loved the game. Yep. I was a season ticket holder at Clyde Bank. And I remember back in the old days, the, the Reserve League used to play on a Monday night. And then on a Monday night, Clyde Bank would always put, they played in the Scottish Premier Reserve League. So I was one, I would, you know, I lived two miles from the stadium. I would wander down every Monday night. And I distinctly remember the players that played in that Reserve League. And I can tell you, and I was probably 13, 14, I would walk down there myself. There was Maurice Johnson, 
there was Paul Elliott, there was Alan McAnally, there was, you know, you could go through them all, Charlie Nicholas uh, and Paul McStay. I remember watching those um, young players as, as teenagers coming through. Morris Johnson was playing for Partick Thistle in a Monday night reserve game against Celtic and became, you know, a world star. But again, felt very fortunate to be able to have that environment and that experience literally on my doorstep on a Monday night was LK. Yeah, I, I had the same experiences and I used to cherish reserve team football. I used to cherish Highland League football. Uh, it didn't really matter for me. Uh, I, I had a, a, a fascination with down the divisions too, where it was part-time football. Brecon City was, was the club that we would probably go to most often if it were not to be Aberdeen because that was the closest in terms of uh, uh, being able to get to an, another team and another ground. But yeah, it was such a rich tapestry back then. It was. And let's digress a couple of final questions here for you, Derek. And, you know, certainly I've been watching your, your social media, which, which I love to stay connected to. What an amazing, you know, um, opportunity for Derek Rangers and yourself. I noticed um, that you've just become a, an ambassador for the club and you're doing some you're doing some work for them to help them out through these tough times. What a great opportunity for them and for you. Oh, 100% from, from my point of view. I, I'm, I'm thrilled to bits that they've asked, very flattered. And it really all came about because last weekend, I decided to put a little tweet out because obviously as a commentator, there's not much to commentate on at the moment, but I do have this love of Scottish football, particularly teams, you know, down the divisions who yeah. don't have a budget yeah. and are often sort of scratching to put things together and trying to be as creative as possible. And I thought, well, what if I, you know, I have a bit of a profile. What if I, you know, volunteer to put my voice on a few things for some of the clubs who maybe need something, maybe yeah. a club video, maybe a commercial, you know, who knows what it is, who knows what'll, what will come back. Well, Berwick were on top of it very quickly. And, and Berwick, I should say that, by the way, I always had a, th a little thing for Berwick Rangers because um, when I was a young boy, uh, obviously they had, they had a name that rhymed with mine. So it's like, oh, yeah. Berwick, Derek. All right. Berwick, Ray, Derek. Ray. Oh, yeah. There you go. You know, so <laughs> there's a sort of a coincidence factor there. But um, they, they got in touch anyway and said, no, we've got a few things. You know, if it's not too much trouble, we'd love for you to do this, 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 and this, and, you know, a, a few different things for their, their tannoy that someday they might be able to put to good use, some commercials, some video stuff. And, and then we just got talking back and forth. And I have a very good friend actually here in, in my town in Massachusetts, a guy called Keith Donaldson, who's from Eyemouth, just a few miles north of Berwick. And he's a lifelong Berwick Ranger supporter. And he's always telling me about the club. He's been telling me about the new board, about the new ideas. And, you know, Berwick Rangers for anybody who doesn't know, an English club, technically speaking, but who play in the Scottish leagues, you know, yeah. just a couple of miles from the border. It's one of these great quirks that I love about yeah. Scottish football. Yeah. And um, they, but they have dropped into the Lowland League, you know, so they're, they're not in the, the SPFL at the moment. They have hopes, obviously, of, of returning. But they then sort of said, you know, could we call you a club ambassador? It'd be great if we could, you know, just have a, a an arrangement and sort of see where it goes. And I said, I would absolutely love that. You know, it really appeals just to, to my sense of wanting to do something, even in a small way for a community club, for a club that really matters in the, 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 the grand pantheon of Scottish football, because Barrett Rangers are part of that, even though they are technically an English club. And I was lucky enough to broadcast a couple of their matches um, when I was back in the UK for almost a decade with BT Sport, we did a couple of Berwick Rangers against Rangers games. Right. And that was a great part. For me, that was the great part of Rangers um, trying to come up from the, the bottom division was I got to go to all these grounds as a commentator that no TV commentator will ever get to, to visit again. Yeah. And um, so I feel quite lucky to have done that. So, so with Berwick Rangers, it really is a case of let's see where it goes. Let's see if there are a few ideas. Let's see if there's... there's you know, something I can do in a small way at this end yeah. to, to help a club that, uh, that I feel really matters. What a, what a great fit that is, Derek. And just to bring us on to the last question here, how did, how did again, a, a guy from Hazelhead, Hazelhead Academy end up commentating in the NFL? You know, it always fascinates me watching your journey. And, you know, I certainly watched the NFL. I, I'm a Baltimore Ravens fan. But I watched, you know, the impact and... and how you've gone here and that must be a new challenge, a, a new, you know, a new level of experience for you to go and submerge yourself really outside your comfort zone. 
Yeah, and that really was what it was all about from my point of view, Eric. When we left the UK in 2017, I said to my wife, I said, one of the things I would love to do when we go back to the States is get out of my comfort zone a little bit. I still want to broadcast football. It's always going to be my first love. I still want to go to Germany if I can. I'd love to do a few more World Cups and Euros. But, you know, if there were to be something that just is a bit different, and I didn't know what that was. Well, I got a call from a guy who I'd worked with, and it's a small world in broadcasting, a guy who I'd worked with 25 years ago on a South American football highlight show in New York that we did not long after that 94 World Cup. And um, he's a sports producer of, of some reputation. And he said, here's something that's going on. Prime Video are looking at finding uh, a British play-by-play -play announcer, as we say here in the States, British yeah. commentator, to, to do the NFL. Yeah. He said, I thought of you. He said, I thought maybe that's something that would appeal to you. And first of all, I, I was thinking, okay, I know a bit about the NFL. I, I took an interest in it when I first came to the States and even prior to that in the 80s when it was on Channel 4 in the UK. Yeah. But could I commentate on a game? And, and I took a day or so to just sort of reflect on it. He came back to me and said, you know, they would want you to be you. They wouldn't want you to turn yourself into, you know, a facsimile of Al Michaels. They, they, they would want Derek Ray. Yeah. So um, the more I thought about it, the more I thought this is absolutely perfect. Now, um, it obviously requires homework, just as every assignment does. Yeah. But I have loved it. We've done it for three years now with Prime Video. And um, I prepare for it much the same way that I prepare for uh, a soccer match. And, yeah. um, you know, a lot of notes and, and numbers and memorizing things. Um, and, and, you know, I've got a very good producer in Jeff Strauss, who, yeah. who is in my ear. If there's something that I'm not quite on top of, he'll be able to, to guide me in the right direction because I didn't grow up with the sport. Yeah. But I, I found it really a brilliant experience. And, and thankfully, we seem to have attracted an audience of people, many of whom are soccer fans, many of whom, you know, like the, the Scottish Irish sound because Tommy Smith, Irishman, is my co-commentator on it. Yeah. And um, we, we, we just have fun. We have fun with it while trying to be accurate, putting our own stamp on it, and um, long may it continue. And, and I think the million dollar question here, Derek, is, is do you find that you become an NFL fan? Uh, yeah, much more so. I mean, I, I was never not an NFL fan, but yeah. what I would say is for probably you know, the best part of my time living here in the USA, it's taken a backseat because I just sort of felt my sport is soccer. Yeah. And you know, I'm trying to keep track of four or five different leagues. You know, certainly my ESPN days, I had to do that, you know, four or five different leagues at a time. But now I don't. As a freelance broadcaster, now I can sort of pick and choose. And, you know, German football is probably the thing that I work most closely on, some Premier League for NBC. Um, but I can make it all work to, you know, my, my own personal schedule. So, yeah, it has made me more of an NFL fan. I find myself watching games, whereas before I might have had half an eye on, on the games. Now I, I watch all the, the big games. And, um, yeah, the Baltimore Ravens, who, you know, were excellent last season. And actually, yeah, yeah I mean, I... Should have won it. Should have won it, but you know, that's a story for another day. But well, um, that story is, it certainly yeah. is. Derek. But this has been an absolute pleasure. I, I, I honestly think I could sit here all day with you and go in all sorts of directions. I never expected to have this conversation talking about Andy Ritchie or Martin. You know, I never really had him on my notes. But as soon as you start talking to people, that's when you, you know, the hairs begin to stand up on your neck because that, that was, those were your format of years. And, and, yeah. and I remember the Andy Ritchies. I remember the Frank McDougals. I remember the Davy Coopers. And, and those were players that I looked up to and I so admired. And probably similar to yourself is, is what I found a love and passion for the game. But, you know, thank you so much for giving us time, you know, giving us your time, Derek. It was an absolute pleasure sitting with you. And uh, I, know you're, I know you're an avid walker, and I know you've probably got to go out and get your walk in for the day up the coast. Is that on your schedule for the rest of today? It is, in actual fact. It's been raining here in Massachusetts much of the day, but it's supposed to, to dry off. So, yeah, that's what I do. I, I, you're right. You, you have done your homework. I, I, oh, I've I do. done my homework. I, I, and I, I certainly I love your updates, you know, about your walks along the coast. And I can certainly visualize. I've spent many time in New England. It's a, it's a beautiful part of the world. And... and you know, just that this was such a joy and, and so thankful that you could join us today. Um, just an absolute pleasure and thanks for being with us, Derek. Thanks for the invitation, Eric. It was great fun. And uh, again, I feel very privileged to be in this starting 11 of yours. And we're privileged to have you.
Thanks again, David. Take care. Be safe. All the best. You too. All the best. Bye-bye.